Hey class, I hope you guys have been enjoying our study of Arthurian romance, Arthurian legend, and author Chrétien de Troyes and his works Lancelot and Percival. I've certainly been enjoying putting the lessons together for you guys. Uh, the Arthurian legends are some of my favorite stories in literature, and so it's been a lot of fun, and I hope you guys have been enjoying it as well. Today we're going to move towards the end of the medieval period and talk about another work of Arthurian legend. Uh, that is written by author Sir Thomas Mallory called Les Mortes d'Arthur. Um, and so we're looking at two different points in the literary development of the Arthur story. We're looking at uh, kind of the beginning of Arthurian stories being written down with Chrétien de Troyes, and now we're looking at kind of the end of Arthurian stories being written down in the medieval period, uh, because Le Mort d'Arthur is written at the very, very end of the medieval period. Um, Certainly, Arthur stories continue to be written long after the medieval period. In fact, they're still being written today. But we're kind of bookending the medieval period itself with kind of the beginnings of the Arthur stories and the end of the Arthur stories in that era. So we're going to talk a little bit about author Sir Thomas Mallory, and then we're going to talk a little bit about Le Mort d'Arthur and what makes this book unique and what makes it so important in the development of literature in Europe. So, author Sir Thomas Mallory has been called by one scholar a mysterious author for a mysterious tale. Um, unlike Chrétien de Troyes, who we still don't know much about, but we know which specific person we're talking about, we're not exactly sure who Sir Thomas Mallory was. There are a number of people who have the same name or similar names that lived around this time period that could potentially be authors for this book. And so the story of Arthur is somewhat mysterious and it's kind of fitting that the author of this full story of Arthur is somewhat mysterious as well. The title Sir is usually attached to his name, and so most scholars believe that he was probably actually a knight. Um, we don't know that for certain, but because Sir is so often tagged on to his name and that is the title for a knight, we assume that he probably was. Now, which knight exactly? Um, we don't know, but we do know that he was well educated enough to read both French and English and to be able to uh, read Arthur stories in both of those languages and draw on them as sources for his work on Arthur. Um, and so that means he was from uh, a fairly wealthy family, someone in the upper class. Um, and so a knight is a probable, a probable family level that he might have come from. Um, the most popular candidate for Sir Thomas Mallory is Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revelle. Um, there have been a number of scholars who have put together quite a bit of evidence to suggest that this is the Sir Thomas Mallory that we're talking about, um, but we don't know for certain, um, and we probably never will know for certain. Uh, there have been a few other authors proposed. Uh, some people have proposed a Welsh poet, Thomas Maylor, which kind of when anglicized, taken from the Welsh, lang Welsh language into the English language, would become Thomas Mallory. Others have suggested Thomas Mallory of Papworth or Thomas Mallory of Hutton Conyers. Um, but the most popular uh, candidate remains Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revelle. Now, regardless of which Thomas Mallory we're talking about. Most sources agree that Sir Thomas Mallory probably wrote Le Mort d'Arthur in prison, which means that he was in trouble with the law at some level, at some point in his life. What exactly that trouble means, we're not sure. Early sources don't tell us why Thomas Mallory was in prison, and so we have to guess why he may have been in prison based on which Thomas Mallory we think he might be. Um, if he was Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revell, he may have in fact been quite a thug, a criminal, a person of a disreputable character. There are some quite nasty stories about the kinds of crimes that Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Revell committed. And some scholars have kind of raised objections and say that that doesn't really fit with his promotion of chivalry and good conduct and good behavior that he presents in Le Mort d'Arthur. And so some scholars say that there's a disconnect there um, and that 
this may mean that Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Ravel is not the actual Sir Thomas Mallory who wrote the work. Regardless of which Thomas Mallory we think he is, uh, the most likely reason that he was in prison at the time that he wrote the work was because he was a political prisoner of some sort. Um, the War of the Roses was going on in England, and this was a civil war between two branches of the same family who were both claiming that their descendants were rightful heirs to the throne. And this was kind of the last major event in medieval England, right before England kind of launches into the Renaissance. And so there was uh, quite a bit of tension in the country and quite a bit of fighting. And Sir Thomas Mallory of Newbold Ravel seems to have fought actually for both sides, both the Yorks and the Lancasters. He seems to have fought for them at different points. Um, we're not exactly sure which side the other Thomas Mallory's may have been fighting for or supporting, but it seems probable that Sir Thomas Mallory, whoever he was, ended up in prison because of the Civil War and he was kind of a political prisoner. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that he was hanging out in a dungeon. Um, if he was in fact a knight, he was probably treated quite well and he was probably just under a form of house arrest. Essentially, he was in a castle and he was a prisoner. He was not allowed to go where he wanted and do what he wanted, but he would have had access to the castle's library and would have been able to have books brought to him and meals brought to him, probably would have had a fireplace in his room um, and so forth, and a comfortable time to work on um, his book, Le Mort d'Artour. It's fairly certain that Sir Thomas Mallory spent many years in jail um, because this is quite an undertaking. The book is quite lengthy um, and it uh, would have taken a long time to read all these different Arthurian legends and write them in prose uh, the way that Sir Thomas Mallory was writing them uh, and, and piece them all together to be this one cohesive work. Um, Sir Tom, uh, sorry, Le Mort d'Artour was not actually published, though, during Sir Thomas Mallory's lifetime. It was published after his death. We don't know exactly whether or not he died imprisoned, um, but we do know that the book was published by William Caxton. Now, William Caxton, uh, we don't know how he got a hold of the manuscript, but he decided to publish Thomas Mallory's work. He was actually the first man to bring the printing press to England. And so, um, he was very well known and uh, was a very important figure as he started printing English works on the printing press. Um, of course, one of the first works that he uh, printed was the Bible. Um, he also printed Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales and then Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort d'Artour. The title actually also comes from William Caxton and it's kind of amusing because um, his French is not perfect in the title. He uses the wrong article in front of Mort d'Artour. It should be a different article if the French was correct. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit interesting. He probably chooses a French title um, simply because some of the early works of Arthurian legend were written in French, right? Chrétien de Troyes' works were written in French. And so it's kind of in that tradition that he chooses a French title, even though the work itself is written in English. Uh, Sir Thomas Mallory was an English speaker and he did write the work in English. Uh, Thomas Mallory also wrote the work in prose, which is a little bit of a shift. You probably noticed that the early Arthurian romances were written in verse, particularly Percival is written in verse, the translation that we read, although the translation of Lancelot that we read was not rendered in verse, though it would have originally been in verse or poetry. So uh, Thomas Mallory writes Le Mort d'Artour in prose and in English, so it's different in those two ways from the early texts, but Caxton still chooses to give it a French title. Um, hoping to tie it in to the much earlier tradition of Clotien de Troyes and his works. So let's talk a little bit more about this book. I already mentioned that it is in prose and it's written in English. Um, and there had been a number of Arthurian works written in English by this point. Um, although the Arthurian stories started being written down in French, they were originally English stories coming from Great Britain, and eventually the written stories migrate their way back up 
to England and there begin to be original works that are written in English as well. One of the really significant things about Le Morte d'Artur is that Le Morte d'Artur is the first book that brings all the different legends about Arthur and his knights and all those characters together into one whole cohesive work. Prior to this, the stories had all been little snippets here and there. There may have been a little bit about Arthur here and a story about one of his knights there and a story about another one of his knights and then another story about Arthur and then another story about another knight. And so they're just kind of a little bit here and there. And they were shorter stories, uh, shorter pieces of literature that were written to just give little glimpses. And what Sir Thomas Mallory does, the task that he undertakes, is to take all these different stories and figure out how they could all fit together and make one complete story, because there had been no complete story of King Arthur. And this is why Le Mort d'Artur, of all of the Arthurian works, is considered uh, generally the gold standard, right? It's considered the closest we might ever get to an official version of King Arthur. Um, there really is no official version because every story tells it a little bit differently. But Sir Thomas Mallory is certainly the closest we get to an official version, simply because he's the first person to put all the stories together. So the characters of Arthurian legend were already well known, and many of the stories that Mallory is telling are already stories that are well known, though he has to choose what version of the story to tell, because some of these stories have different versions. For example, does he decide to have Percival or Galahad uh, find the Holy Grail? Ultimately, he chooses Galahad. Um, so there's, uh, there's, they're slightly different versions and he has to decide what version he's going to go with and sometimes he puts his own original creative spin on it. Um, so it's quite a monumental undertaking to do what he's done and take all the stories and put them together. Um, he drew on both French and English sources to write the book so he looks at pretty much all of the Arthurian stories that are available to him in the languages that he can read and speak. Um, and so he draws on all those stories and kind of has to do a lot of research in order to do that and then decide how to tell the stories. But he also added one of his own original storylines that we did not see anywhere prior to Sir Thomas Mallory. The tale of Sir Gareth is Thomas Mallory's own original invention. And so in that way, he also continues in the tradition of Chrétien de Troyes. Chrétien de Troyes uh, added some of his own characters to the Arthur storyline, including Lancelot and Gawain um, and Percival. And so his, his addition of those characters uh, was what made Clétien de Troyes stand out. And so Ch Sir Thomas Mallory decides to add his own character and his own story as well um, to continue in that tradition. La Morte Artur, uh, because it combines all these different kinds of stories together, ends up just being kind of a book that has it all. And so there's something that appeals to almost every reader in La Morte Artur, which is also one of the reasons why it has been such a popular and long-lasting work down through literary history. There's so much going on and there's so many different kinds of stories and plot elements included in here. So if you like swordplay and epic battles, there's plenty of that. Um, if you like romance, there's certainly a fair bit of romance in here, particularly the story of Lancelot and Guinevere. Um, if you like magic and fantasy, um, Mallory includes the wizard Merlin and the witch Morgana and all those different kinds of things. Um, if you like revenge plots um, and uh, kind of tragedy, uh, that sort of thing is here uh, with Mordred and his plan to take his father's throne and the tragic ending that that comes to. If you like philosophical questions, um, deep themes that are still relevant to today, Le Morte d'Artur includes plenty of those. And there's spiritual questions and a quest for spiritual truth as well, with the quest for the Holy Grail and other, uh, other Christian elements that are also incorporated into Le Morte d'Artur. So there's really a lot to Le Morte d'Artur, which makes it a very interesting book and a very interesting read.
Sir Thomas Mallory also grapples with a lot of different themes and messages in Le Mort d'Artur. One of the things that he does emphasize in particular with the ending of the book is some contemporary concerns in the world in which he was living. Of course, the War of the Roses was a civil war, and, and Sir Thomas Mallory explores the dangers of infighting, right? Fighting among yourselves with your own countrymen and even with your own family, uh, which was true in the War of the Roses and is true in the story of Arthur when you come down to the final war between Arthur and Mordred. Arthur is fighting against his own son. Um, and so there is quite a bit of kind of commentary and maybe some criticism of the way things are going in England at the time and a warning, like, let's, let's stop this civil war. This could tear us apart and ruin our country. Um, and so Sir Thomas Mallory seems to be suggesting that quite strongly. But Mallory also addresses some timeless themes that appeal to us regardless of what century we live in. Um, he ask questions like, what are the consequences of sin? What does it mean to be a good person? Who is a good person? Is Lancelot a good person? He's a great knight, he's strong, he's skillful, um, he's loyal, but he's also cheating on Arthur with the queen, right? Well, maybe that's not quite the right way to say it. He's, uh, the queen is cheating on Arthur with him. Um, but but you get the idea, right? Like uh, Lancelot may be an excellent knight, but is that really what it takes to be a good person? Or is Galahad, his son, who decides to forego any sort of earthly romance and to maintain purity and chastity in his quest for Christ and for the Holy Grail? Is that what it takes to be a good person? Why are rules and order important? That's another question that Sir Thomas Mallory asks. Um, that we that may be a little bit of a foreign question to us today, right? Um, a lot of American culture is kind of against rules and order. And yet we're living in a time with this COVID-19 virus and all the things that we're being asked to do when there has been a lot more rule and order imposed on our lives. And why is that sometimes necessary? Why is that sometimes important? Why are there times when we have to follow rule and order? And why are rule and order an essential part of society? And Thomas Mallory really grapples with that. There's this whole idea of worldly versus spiritual pursuits as well. Um, and there's a lot of Christian elements incorporated into Le Mort d'Artur. The idea of loyalty versus betrayal comes up in a number of different ways throughout the work. So you can see that Mallory is not only addressing some of the issues of his current day, but he's also addressing issues that can pertain to us as well. And mean that the work Le Mort d'Artur is not just a work for the past, but it's a work for today too. So we're going to be reading a small slice of Le Mort d'Artur. It's a very, very long book, over 800 pages, so I am not going to ask you to read anywhere close um, to the whole thing. We're just going to be reading the first few chapters. And the first few chapters cover Arthur's birth and boyhood up to the point where he pulls the sword from the stone. Of course, the sword in the stone is one of the most well-remembered uh, portions of the Arthur story. Um, and it's been immortalized in a number of different ways, in films and so forth. Um, so it's, it's a fitting one to read. Um, and we've been reading about uh, stories about Arthur's knights once Arthur is grown and he's king. And so we're going to read about how Arthur became king, right? From the time he was born uh, up to the point where he uh, proves that he is king of all England. So you're going to be reading that, and I'm going to have a fun activity for you guys to do in response to that. Um, so I hope you're ready to be a little creative and have a little bit of fun. This is going to be different, and I hope um, uh, enjoyable and that you guys will enjoy seeing each other's work on this. So I'm being a little bit cryptic and mysterious, but I will give you instructions on your assignment uh, on on Canvas. So, all right, guys, uh, thanks for tuning in for this lecture. Uh, I hope you enjoy reading this section of Le Mort d'Artur, and I hope you guys have a good rest of your day.